Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the concluding part of my top 100 Formula One moments of all time. Now, previously I've covered race starts, pit stop blunders, crashes, pole positions, race wins, and last lap disasters. And now, let's go for the more behind the scenes stuff, if you will. Some of the stuff is behind the scenes and others, well, they were very dramatic when we, when we saw them play out on track. This part, we're going to kick off with my top 10 controversial moments in Formula 1 history. So, I've got two honourable mentions for this list. And that being Spygate 2007 and Crashgate for 2008 and 2009. So, Spygate was the moment in the season where McLaren were disqualified from the Constructors' Championship after it was discovered that Mike Coughlin and Nigel Stepney had exchanged information or it was something along those lines. Mike, Co Mike Coughlin had come into possession of confidential information from Ferrari and as it turned out when the information was about to be photocopied the employee at the shop at the time was a Ferrari fan and as a result contacted the Ferrari factory both Coughlin and Stepney were fired from their teams. Alonso, De La Rosa and Hamilton were granted immunity from all this. But McLaren were found guilty eventually. And as a result, they were fined £100 million and were disqualified from the Constructors' Championship. Meaning for the 2008 to th means for the 2008 season, they would have to use numbers 22 and 23, because this was back when we still had 11 teams in the sport. Crashgate, on the other hand, I have briefly I did mention the Singapore Grand Prix from 2008 in my top 10 pit stop blunders, but that wasn't the most infamous moment of the race. That was Nelson Piquet's crash on purpose, might I add. And that was the moment that effectively blacklisted him from racing in Formula 1 ever again. Pat Simmons and Flavio Briatore were banned from all FIA sports because of this. They did manage to get those bans overturned, however. But... This Crashgate incident was effectively a case of race fixing. ING, who was the title sponsor for Renault in the 2009 season, they, they legged it out of there. They withdrew because they didn't want to be associated with a team that cheated. But ironically enough, Romain Grosjean, who replaced Nelson Piquet Jr. after Piquet was fired spun in exactly the same way at the exact same corner that PK did 12 months beforehand. After PK was fired from Renault, he took it upon himself to report to the FIA that effectively he was told to crash on purpose to allow Alonso to win the race. And it's because of that incident, because of the whole Crashgate fiasco, that Massa believes that incident was what cost him the championship. And that's on top of the pit stop blunder that he endured. 
So, number 10. And it's the first in a double header for the 1982 season. Yes, I wasn't around at the time. I was born in 93 to be exact. So I'm fast approaching 28. But doing a bit of research heading into this, doing a bit of research heading into this particular topic of my top F1 moments of all time, I had to delve a little deeper into the archives and I managed to find a double header of incidents from the 1982 season, the start of the season to be specific. Because number 10, we are kicking off with South Africa. Now, there was a lot of controversy. This is a summary of the events. The prelude to the race was notable for a strike action by the Grand Prix Drivers Association, led by Niki Lauda and DDA Peroni at the time. There was new super license conditions imposed by FISA, a forerunner to the FIA at the time, which was meant to have seen drivers tied to a single team for up to three years. Because of this, all of the drivers went on strike and they were given an ultimatum. Turn up to race or your super license will be revoked. And that was to every single driver. They st- the F1 drivers, they stood their ground. And they even took it upon themselves to hire a conference room where you had a couple of drivers, one of them being Gilles Villeneuve, entertaining the drivers by playing on the grand piano. The race did go ahead, but in the end, FISA ended up going back on that compromise and they were fined anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 US dollars and were handed race bans as a result. But the drama wasn't over there, folks. The FIA Court of Appeal managed to reduce the penalties and criticised Fisa's handling over the whole fiasco. But that wouldn't be the only controversial moment of the season. Because one race later, at number 9, Brazil, 1982. Nelson Piquet for Brabham and Keke Rosberg for Williams finished first and second. But they were both disqualified as, the, as it was found that both of their cars were underweight. And as a result of this, the F1 Constructors Association boycotted the San Marino a couple of races later. The problem ended up being a seven gallon water ballast tank, a ballast water tank, sorry, which was supposedly used to cool the brakes. And it would gradually empty during the race and then be replenished at the end so as to pass post-race scrutineering. Seven weeks, seven weeks later, the FIA Court of Appeal, the FIA Appeals Tribunal stood their ground with the disqualifications and eventually the tanks would be banned. Now on to some more familiar moments for myself. Number eight, the European Grand Prix of 1997. Europe 1997, it was the season finale. Jacques Villeneuve and Michael Schumacher battling it out for the championship. The controversial moment was Michael trying to intentionally take Jacques Villeneuve out of the race, much like how he did in... 1994 with Damien Hill and we'll get to that very shortly. Schumacher ended up in the gravel and out of the race and Martin Brundle's immortal words that day, that didn't work Michael, you hit the wrong part of him my friend. Villeneuve managed to keep going 
and get the points that he needed to secure the championship. But the drama started after the race. Schumacher ended up being disqualified from the championship and as a result lost second place in the standings. And the media, especially here in the UK, slaughtered Schumacher because of it. And at that point, his reputation was effectively in ruins. When you mention to somebody the likes of Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost, you immediately go, oh yeah, Japan 89 and Japan 1990. With Fernando Alonso, you go, oh yeah, Crashgate 2008, Singapore. Michael Schumacher, Australia 94, and Hareth 1997. Talking of Michael Schumacher, he was involved in another controversial moment in his, in his final season before his first retirement, Monaco 2006, where he apparently lost control of his Ferrari at Rascas, preventing Alonso from getting pole position. Schumacher was subsequently given a grid penalty and as a result ended up not starting on pole. Just another controversial moment to add to his polarizing career, if you will. And this is coming from somebody that grew up as a massive Michael Schumacher fan. Number six, Australia 2009. Well, 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 the start of the season certainly had its dramatic moments. Braun GP rising from the ashes of Honda, like a phoenix, and ending up winning both construct the Drivers' and Constructors' Championship, and as a result, ended up becoming one of the greatest fairy tale stories of the season. And it all started in Australia. But that's not really the moment we're going to be going on about here. A late safety car that resulted in the race finishing under the safety car, saw Yano Trulli go off the track at the final chicane. Hamilton getting ahead of him. And Hamilton wanting to make sure it was okay. Trulli then ended up get Trulli was then allowed past Hamilton. And the McLaren engineers had misled the race officials into thinking that Trulli had overtaken Hamilton under the safety car. But, oh, those team radio transmissions. They are a wonderful thing these days. And we'll get on to that very, very shortly. Trulli was subsequently disqualified. But in the end, it was Hamilton that got disqualified. Hamilton disqualified and truly was reinstated onto the podium. Number five. Fernando is faster than you. Can you confirm you understood that message? This is back when team orders were banned. That was a coded message to Felipe Massa at the 2010 German Grand Prix to effectively tell him, let Alonso pass. And then they had the goal to apologize to Massa. For, to many a peep, to many a fan, that was clearly team orders. Even some of the, even the other teams and some of the presenters for the BBC said, yeah, that is blatant team orders. And it's not hard to see why. Ferrari are no stranger to controversial team orders, which again, we'll get into shortly. Alonso ended up winning the race, but for many people it's a win that he never really deserved. Number four. USA 2005. USA 2005. 12 years old and I actually watched this play out over the course of the whole weekend. 
qualifying on the Saturday was when we actually, when the viewers actually got details of what on earth was going on. The tyres that Michelin had brought for their seven teams, the seven teams that were supplying, were failing. And they, it was a case of they couldn't guarantee that the tyres would be safe for more than 10 laps. The teams tried, the teams and Michelin tried everything they could to ensure the Michelin runners were able to race. But one Max Mosley was Adam was standing his ground and effectively blaming Michelin for not bringing the right tyres. And one of the options was a chicane at the final banking to reduce the speeds. But the problem there is when it came to the emergency meeting that was held with all the teams, well, except for Ferrari. Ferrari said no. And therefore, because of the uh, tight relationship that the FIA, the FIA had with Ferrari at the time, if Ferrari said no, then it didn't happen. No chicane was built. No compromise was... No compromise was reached. One of the other options that was considered was Bridgestone allowing the Michelin runners to use the Bridgestone tyres for that one race. But even that wasn't allowed because Mosley wasn't going to let them. And as a result of all this, all 14 Michelin drivers pulled into the pits at the end of the formation lap. And they effectively didn't start the race. And the whole reason for Ferrari not agreeing to all of this was the fact that it would be such an easy win for one Michael Schumacher. I mean, if I'm being honest, I couldn't even call that a proper race. Nobody could. The only one that was really celebrating at the end of the day was Thiago Montero, who got his one and only podium that season. But the problem there is that nobody was celebrating because of how big a farce the whole situation was. Number three, Senna versus Prost. Part 1. Japan, 1989. Senna and Prost were in a very heated rivalry. It was becoming impossible for Prost and Senna to work together. And the first, and that peak, the peak of that teammate partnership was reached when we hit Japan, 1989. And Prost and Senna, round about lap 45, collided at the Casio chicane, the Casio triangle. Prost was out of the race, but Senna took the escape road to get himself back into the race. He ended up having to change his front wing and was initially classified as the winner. And since he needed to win to keep himself into the championship. He managed to keep himself in the championship. That is until Prost went to the FIA to 
explain their grievances and Senna was disqualified from the race afterwards resulting in Prost becoming the champion. 12 months later if Prost failed to finish Senna would be the champion. But oh boy where do we begin with the drama? Pole position had been moved off the racing line which Senna clearly wasn't happy about. So he decided I'm going to win this championship my way. So what did he decide to do? This is how Murray Walker quoted it on commentary. And Senna sprints away but Alain Prost takes the lead. It's happened. Alain Prost has taken the advantage. Senna tries to go through on the inside and it's happened immediately. Senna crashed into Prost on purpose. Didn't even try to break. Taking them both out of the race and Senna ended up being the champion. Let's get a recap before we get to number one. And I think we all know what number one's going to be. The honorable mentions being Spygate 2007 and Crashgate from the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix. Number 10, South Africa 1982. Number 9, Brazil 1982. Number 8, Jerez 1997. Number, six, Mono number 7, Monaco 2006. Number 6, Australia 2009. Germany 2010 at number 5. Number 4, USA 2005. Number 3, Japan 89. And number 2, Japan 1990. So I'm just going to get it out of the way. Number, number one, Austria 2002. We all know exactly why this is number one. Round six of the championship. Ferrari were already dominating. It was Barrichello was leading. And yet despite this, team orders were in play. And this is back when team orders were okay. Barrichello was told to slow down to let Michael through. If that wasn't a clear indication that Barrichello was the clear number two driver, I don't know what was. Schumacher and Barrichello ended up breaching podium protocol and Schumacher ended up giving Barrichello his winner's trophy. Well, judging by the reaction from the fans, unhappy would be a massive understatement. And this was the moment where Ferrari were fined £1 million and team orders were banned. So now we're reaching the end. We're in the final third of this top 100. Now there's one thing I love about Formula 1 seasons is that when it comes to the championship and it goes down to the final race of the season that is when things hit their peak. The interest from the fans is at an all-time high. Who's going to win the championship? Who's going to bottle it? Ladies and gentlemen, these are my top 10 championship deciders. Now the only rule I the only rule I needed to put into place here was the fact that this had to be the last race of the season where the championship was on the line. Honorable mention, Mexico 1964. It was without a doubt one of the most, it was one of the most dramatic finales in the history of the world championship. At the time, championship points could only be scored, scored by the top six. Nine points for a win, six for second, then four, three, two, and one. Heading into the race, three drivers could be within a shot of the championship. Graham Hill with 39 points, John Surtees with 34, and Jim Clark with 30. The championship permutations were as follows. Clark needed to win the race and ensure Surtees didn't finish higher than third, or Hill 
finishing and ensuring Hill didn't finish higher than fourth. John Surtees could only win the title by finishing first, providing uh, and providing that he finished second, he had to make sure Hill didn't finish any higher than third. The final race results saw Jim Clark retiring with just one lap to go. An oil line broke on his engine and the title was gone. It was only the best six results that's back then that would that would see the championship it was only the best six results that would be counted towards the championship John Surtees beat Graham Hill by just one point after Surtees finished second and Graham Hill finished two laps down Kicking off at number 10, Brazil 2007. Hamilton, Alonso, and Raikkonen. Three drivers battling for the championship. If anything, this felt rather familiar to the 20 to the if anything it felt very similar to that it had a similar ending if you will to the 2006 film cars three drivers and only one of them could walk out as champion and the drama was already there from the start Hamilton making a couple of mistakes and then his engine went into neutral and he had to try and make an alternate strategy work. And despite Lewis's best efforts, best efforts, sorry, despite his best efforts, he was only able to finish seventh, missing out on the title by one point. The winner on the day, Kimi Raikkonen, who also took the top step of the podium. Number nine, Japan, 1996. Now I put this one in, I put this one in specially for the late great Murray Walker, because that line of commentary that day, it was Jacques Villeneuve on the verge of winning the title. Jacques needed to win the race and hope Damon didn't score any points. Or even better yet, retire from the race. But it was Villeneuve that ended up retiring from the race. And Damon came home to win the race. And Murray's iconic line. And I've got to stop. Because I've got a lump in my throat. <laughs> and yes, there were times when Murray did become a massive... Fanboy over the hills. Because he commentated on Graham Hill's races. And Graham Hill being the only driver to have the Triple Crown. The Monaco Grand Prix. The Indy 500. And the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Number 8. Australia. 1986. This one was dramatic in a lot of ways. You had Nigel Mansell, Alan Prost and Nelson Piquet in contention for the championship. KK Rosberg ended up retiring from what would be his last race thanks to a tyre failure at lap 62. But one lap later, in one of the most spectacular tyre failures of all time, and look at that! And colossally, that's Mansell! Nigel Mansell ended up 
with a spectacular tyre failure, and he ended up out of the race and out of the championship. This then left PK to battle it out with Prost. Because heading into the race, Mansell had 70 points. Prost had 64. And PK had 63. Williams had secured the Constructors' Championship. It was, just a ma- it was just a question of whether they would be able to secure the Drivers' Championship. Sadly, it wasn't to be. And although Nelson Piquet's tally ended up at 69, Alain Prost managed to secure the title with a win at the track. His final points tally being on 72 because they were still using the dropped results system at the time. Even without the dropped points system, Mansell would have been on 72 and Prost would have been on 74. Meaning even without the dropped results system, Prost would have still wrapped up the championship. Number 7. Abu Dhabi, 2014. Hamilton versus Rosberg. Nico Rosberg. Double points on offer for this final race. Something that has never been used again before or since. An epic duel between the two Mercedes drivers in what would be the first of seven consecutive seasons of dominance from the Mercedes team. And it's not very often we get to see the Drivers' Championship decided at the final race of the season. The last time that happened will be an entry for later on. But this would be the penultimate, this would be the penultimate time this would happen beforehand. 2014 Abu Dhabi, double points on offer. Issues for Rosberg towards the end of the race resulted in Hamilton taking not only the race win, but also his second Drivers' Championship. Number six, Brazil 2012. Where do we even begin with this one? Where do we even begin with this one? Chaotic race, Brazil, wet weather, final race of the season, championship up for grabs. Might feature later on in this list. It was between Vettel and Alonso. There was drama up and down the field. And it all climaxed with a crash that brought out the safety car and it also resulted in the race finishing under the safety car. And while it was a McLaren 1-2 with Lewis Hamilton on pole for qualifying, Paul DeResta had an accident on lap 68. An accident that resulted in the safety car coming out. Vettel only needed to defend a 13 point advantage over Alonso. If Alonso won the race, he needed to make sure Vettel finished lower than fourth. Alonso needed to finish at least third to secure the championship and hope Vettel didn't score at all. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Button won the race with Alonso finishing second. But Vettel's sixth place ensured that Vettel would win the championship. And how tight was the margin? Just three points. Abu Dhabi 2010 next. And what a climax that was. This was the last race of the season. 
with four drivers in the running for the championship. The tightest championship battle in Formula One history. And who were the lucky drivers that were in contention for the championship? Sebastian Vettel, Fernando Alonso, Mark Webber, and Lewis Hamilton. Just to put it into a little bit of context, heading into this final race of the championship. Hamilton had an outside chance, but he needed to win the race. Vettel, well, Hamilton was on 222 points. Vettel, 231. Weber, 238. And Alonso, 246. Alonso was leading the championship heading into this final race. Red Bull had already wrapped up the Constructors' Championship as they were 48 points ahead of McLaren. But could they secure the double with Weber or Vettel? As we drew towards race end, Vettel had started on pole and he went on to win the race. That had already ruled Lewis out of championship contention. Vitaly Petrov managed to keep Alonso behind. McLaren was second and third, but it wasn't enough for Hamilton to secure the title because Vettel had already finished ahead. Petrov kept Alonso and Weber behind long enough to ensure that Vettel secured the first of four consecutive world championships. The first for Red Bull, the first for Vettel, and to this day Vettel still holds the record of the youngest Formula One world champion. Sticking with Abu Dhabi now in 2016, and again, Hamilton and Rosberg for the championship. But on this occasion, it was Rosberg who was ahead. Heading into the race, Rosberg was 12 points ahead. Meaning, Hamilton had to meaning Hamilton would need to score 13 points more than Rosberg. So at least third, at least third would secure Hamilton the championship, providing Rosberg didn't finish any higher than ninth. Because if Rosberg finished eighth, he would secure the title by just one point. All Rosberg had to do was finish ahead of Hamilton. And as it turned out, Hamilton could finish fourth and hope Rosberg didn't score to ensure that he became champion. If Rosberg failed to, f failed to score or failed to finish, he needed to make sure Hamilton finished fifth or lower to ensure that Rosberg would rap walk away with the title. Rosberg couldn't get past Hamilton because Hamilton was trying to back the pack up to allow those behind him to overtake Rosberg to secure the championship. Despite his best efforts, it wasn't to be. Hamilton did win the race, but Rosberg walked away with the title, winning it by just five points. Number three, Japan, 2003. I remember getting up at six o'clock that morning to watch this race and what a moment it was. Raikkonen versus Schumacher. Raikkonen needed to win and hope Schumacher failed to score. Because if, if Schumacher did score one point, Schumacher would win on countback because he had won more races than Raikkonen over the course of the season. But it was Raikkonen's consistency throughout that season that secured him the opportunity to win the championship. Raikkonen would have to wait another four years to be able to win that championship. Schumacher ended up with front wing damage early on in the race, putting him at the back of the field. Despite this, 
He managed to claw his way up. He kept climbing. Rubens Barrichello won the race for Ferrari, wrapping up the Constructors' Championship that day as well. Raikkonen finished second, putting him at the time just one point behind Schumacher. But Michael secured that eighth place he needed to ensure that he became the first ever six-time champion. And since then, only Lewis Hamilton has been able to match that feat. And talking of Michael Schumacher, I mentioned it earlier, and I'm bringing it up here. Australia, 1994. Where on earth do we even begin with this one? Australia, 1994. Hill and Schumacher. A mistake from Schumacher allowed Hill to go for the overtake and get himself ahead. At least, that's what he thought. Schumacher managed to damage Damon Hill's suspension. It's... It, it was one of the first of many controversial moments throughout Schumacher's career. And Hill ended up retiring from the race the same way Schum in the same way that Schumacher ended up out of the race. But because Schumacher was one point ahead, Schumacher managed to secure the championship, albeit in controversial circumstances. So the honourable mention for this list was Mexico 1964, the recap of the top 10 so far. Number 10. Brazil 2007, number 9, Japan 96, number 8, Australia 1986, number 7, Abu Dhabi 2014, number 6, Brazil 2012, number 5, Abu Dhabi 2010, number 4, Abu Dhabi 2016, number 3, Japan 2003, and number 2, Australia 1994. And number 1. The hipster pick is in, folks. Japan, 1976. Hunt and Louder. If you haven't already, folks, I would highly recommend you watch Rush. It's a great dramatization of this epic season in Formula One history. Japan 1976 saw Lauda ahead of Hunt by just a handful of points. The track was raining very hard because of how wet it was and given Lauda's crash earlier in the season. Lauda ended up voluntarily retiring from the race. But Hunt, he kept soldiering on. And ended up with tyre issues towards the end of the race. Had to come in, change them. Dropping him out of the third place that he needed to secure the championship. The amazing thing was he did manage to get himself into that third place to secure the championship. Winning it by just a single point. And like I said earlier, if you haven't already, I'd highly recommend you go and see Rush. Because it is without a doubt one of the best sports films I've ever seen. We're reaching lists end now. So here we go. So I think it's only fitting that we have the second part of our last race of the season section. With, our top, with my top 10 season climaxes. And again, these just have to be the final race of the season. The Honourable Mention, Abu Dhabi 2018. Now, 
nothing spectacular here, but the great thing was the best part of that whole race was the donuts between Hamilton, the donuts with Vettel, Hamilton, and Fernando Alonso, who had announced he was retiring from Formula One at the end of that season. Oh, wait, hang on. He's coming back for 2021. Huh. I guess we can class I can get I guess we can class that his first retirement. The donuts between them. Because at the time, il three drivers with eleven world championships between them. Donuts on that main straight. What a moment. Despite the dominance of the Williams team throughout that season in 1992. The 1992 race definitely gave us, one, a massive shock to the system, and two, a sign of the future that was yet to come. And while it was another pole position for one Nigel Mansell, Etten Senna ended up alongside him on the front row. But incredibly, lap 18, Senna and Mansell with a collision, putting them both out of the race. And Ricardo Patrese on lap 50 ended up with engine issues of his own, putting him out on lap 50. Gerhard Berger was the man that won the race on the day. With Michael Schumacher and Martin Brundle rounding up the podium. Now one of the reasons why I put this up, one of the reasons why I put this on the list is the fact that we were not expecting that sort of bad luck to happen to Williams. Pole position, but yet not getting any points. Number nine, and it's another trip to Abu Dhabi. 2009. This was actually the first trip to Abu Dhabi. Despite Hamilton starting on pole, he wasn't able to open up a strong enough lead to be able to secure a pit, the pit stop advantage he needed. So after the first round of pit stops, Vettel ended up inheriting the lead. And Hamilton ended up retiring because of brake issues. Vettel winning the race in Abu Dhabi definitely capped off what was, without a doubt, a very unpredictable season. The controversial moments at the start of the season, that heavy wet race in Malaysia, Vettel's debut season with Red Bull, the rise of Braun, And overall, just another fantastic season for the sport. Number 8, Japan 2002. Now, this climax just capped off what was arguably one of the most dominant seasons in Formula 1 history. Schumacher had already wrapped up the champion. Michael Schumacher had already wrapped up the championship. And Ferrari were already constructors champions. Alan McNish wasn't able to participate in the race because of a heavy crash in qualifying, ruling him out of the race. 11 wins for Schumacher that season. The most at the time. Sticking with Ferrari. And it was the Constructors' Championship up for grabs in Malaysia for 2000. Just a couple of weeks after Schumacher wrapped up his first Drivers' Championship for Ferrari, 
Could he secure the double in Malaysia? Simple answer, yes. Heading into the race, it was, it was Ferrari and McLaren in contention for the championship. Heading into the final race of the season, McLaren were 13 points ahead behind Ferrari. Ferrari only needed three points to secure the championship. They ended up winning the championship by 18 points. It was Ferrari's second Constructors' Championship in a row. The first of six. Number six, Brazil 2004. Another dominant season for the Ferrari team. So dominant that a rule change needed to come into play for the 2005 season that would end Ferrari's dominance. But it was all about the South Americans on the day. Juan Pablo Montoya securing the win. Juan Pablo Montoya winning the race from second. Barrichello managed to start on pole. And although he wouldn't be able to break the Brazil curse as far as securing a race win on home soil. He did manage to secure a podium after the heartbreak of last of the previous season. Another trip to Abu Dhabi now, and it is Abu Dhabi 2015. Rosberg had managed to secure his sixth consecutive pole position and went on to win the race ahead of Hamilton. It was without a doubt one of the most... It was another dominant season in the sport. But this time it was for, for, for Mercedes rather than Ferrari. Rosberg showing that even though the championship had already been decided a couple of races beforehand at the USA, he still had what it took. He showed that he still had what it took to challenge Hamilton for the Drivers' Championship. Rosberg, for Rosberg, it was his third win in a row. Now, this next entry in the list is sort of a sort of a double header, if you will. It's a double header because it's also a championship decider. Brazil, two thousand and six. Michael Schumacher had an outside chance of winning the championship. However, he needed to win, and hope Alonso didn't score. Because Alon, because Ham. Because Schumacher would win the championship on countback. As he had won more races that season. Compared to Alonso. But again. Like Raikkonen in 2003. It was Alonso's consistency that kept him in the, the championship hunt. On top of a couple of mis unfortunate incidents for Michael. Including an incident at Japan. But that was balanced out with... a. With Alonso going out of the race in Italy. The race where Schumacher announced he was retiring. Disaster for Schumacher at the start. But it resulted in... But it resulted in Alonso securing the championship... And it would be his second championship. Massa took pole and the race win. Alonso's second place was more than enough to secure the championship. Schumacher, after a brave effort, 
finished fourth. The final points tally. Alonso, 13 points ahead of Schumacher. And Renault were only five points ahead. Securing the Constructors' Championship that race as well. Because Ferrari was still in the championship hunt at this point. <music> Renault would win their first Constructors' Championship in 2005 at the season finale in China. That was a dramatic race even before it all got started. Making their way to the grid and Schumacher and one of the Minardis. They ended up having to use the spare car. And while they did manage to both make the start, they were unfortunately not able to do much with it. Because Michael Schumacher had spun off on lap 6. No, he started on lap 22. Schumacher did start 6, but he ended up starting from the pit lane, as did Noreen Kartikeyn and... Christian Albers. Christian Albers ended up with a wheel nut tissue. Maybe I could have covered that in my top 10 pit stop blunders. Alonso ensured that Renault wrapped up the Constructors' Championship with his, with his win, and Fisichella finished fourth. The McLaren of Juan Pablo Montoya, nowhere to be seen. McLaren were only a handful of points ahead. But they needed to but they needed to out outscore Renault by that margin. And they only had Raikkonen to help them. And despite their best efforts, it wasn't to be for McLaren. Number two, Australia. 1995. Williams on pole and the champion Michael Schumacher was only third on the grid. David Coulthard had an accident on lap 19 resulting in him not being able to finish the race. He had an accident trying to get into the pit lane and damaged his suspension. Michael Schumacher was involved in a collision on lap 25 and he ended up out of the race. Mika Hakkinen from McLaren at the time wasn't able to compete because he was injured. Damien Hill winning from pole, securing another win for Williams, but it wouldn't be until the following year when he would wrap up the championship. So the honourable mention for the season climaxes was Abu Dhabi 2018. So, let's recap the top 10 so far. Number 10, Australia 1992. Number 9, Abu Dhabi 2009. Number 8, Japan 2002. Number 7, Malaysia 2000. Number, four, Bra number 6, Brazil 2004. Number 5, Abu Dhabi 2015. Number 4, Brazil 2006. Number 3, China 2005, and number two, Australia 1995. Australia, 1993. Although we wouldn't know it at the time, it would be the last time that we would see Senna on the podium in any capacity. Prost had, already, Prost had already wrapped up the championship for Williams. Williams were already constructors champions. But it was Ed and Senna on pole position for what would be the 62nd time in his career. And Senna winning the race, it would be his last win of his career. 
And although we wouldn't know it at the time, it would be the last time we would see Prost or Senna on the podium. It was it was a moment of unity between Senna and Prost, given the tension over the last couple of years beforehand. But it was amazing to see them back on the same page. So 90 Formula One moments over 70 years of history. So where do we begin? We had the top 10 F1 race starts, pit stop blunders, crashes, pole positions, race wins, last lap disasters, controversial moments, championship deciders, and season climaxes. And now, just what are my favorite races of all time? An honorable mention. Italy, 1976. This is right up there as one of my favorite races of all time, mainly because of how it was portrayed in Rush. This was Nicky Lauda's first race back. He was only gone for six weeks, and yet, despite that, he managed to secure fourth place on his return. And James Hunt ended up out of the race. And this allowed Lauda to stay in the championship hunt. And it went all the way to the last race of the season. Number 10, Austria, 2020. In a season like no other, we, we were facing the prospect of not getting any Formula 1 last year. But lo and behold, we did. And Austria, it felt so good seeing Formula 1 back on our screens. The start of the season delayed by about three months, three or four months. And it was Bottas that took the pole and the race win. There was drama up and down the field. Max Verstappen out because of engine issues. You had both Haas drivers out of the race thanks to some mechanical issues with their brakes. Hamilton and Albon colliding again. Sebastian Vettel, Spinala, again. And Hamilton ended up with a five-second time penalty because of his collision with Albon. And a lot of us were thinking... Are we going to see Lando Norris on the podium? Introducing Scenario 7. Fastest lap of the race as well. And... It was a chaotic race. And it's definitely up there as one of my favourites. Germany 2019 next. This was another chaotic race. And it was the only wet race of the season. And it did not disappoint. Mercedes celebrating an anniversary. With an anniversary livery. Not just for the car. But also... <laughs> the pit crew had some celebratory suits as well. That final corner, it was brutal seeing it all unfold. It was brutal. The number of drivers that went off, including one Charles Leclerc and Nicole Hockenberg, who was so close to his first ever podium, sadly wasn't to be. 
Sebastian Vettel had started right at the back of the grid. Max Verstappen coming out on top. But Vettel finishing second. And even for a point, Racing Point were leading. With Lance Stroll and Daddy's Cash. <laughs> Next, Brazil 2003. Where do we even begin with this one? For extra excitement and drama, please add water. <laughs> and that's exactly what Brazil did, and it did not disappoint. Keep turn three in mind, the Curva do Sol, keep that in mind. The race started under wet weather conditions, and it started behind the safety car. Ralph Furman with a front suspension failure. Take someone else out with him. Montoya, Pizzonia, even the great Michael Schumacher and Jensen Button all out at, at the Curva du Sol. Barrichello did take the lead momentarily. But, oh boy, the heartbreak. Engine issues resulted in him not being able to break that Brazil curse. Fisichella taking the lead from Raikkonen. And Weber with a massive crash after starting third. Safety car out for what would be the fifth time of the day. Fisichella gets through, Raikkonen comes into the pits, and Alonso, red flag. The red flag was initially reported on lap 55, but Fisichella had started lap 56. And thanks to the countback rule on red flags, they had to take the result from two laps previously. Meaning, at the end of lap 54, it was Fisichella that took the win. But the results initially were counted back to lap 53, since the red flag was initially reported on lap 55, not 56. Meaning it was Raikkonen that was initially reported as the winner. Alonso's accident resulted in him being at hospital. Thankfully, he was okay for San Marino the f uh, two weeks later. Fisichella wouldn't receive his winner's trophy until San Marino. But it would result in Jordan's last win of the sea of uh, last ever win. Number seven. Bahrain 2014, the duel in the desert between Rosberg and Hamilton. <sighs> Two drivers at the top of their game, battling lap after lap. Even Pastor Maldonado forced a barrel roll that Fox McLeod would have been proud of. But yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it was Hamilton that came out on top on my 21st birthday, no less. So that left me a very happy man until Brock Lesnar broke Undertaker's streak, which I still haven't forgiven Lesnar for. Or Vince, for that matter. Number six, Hungary, 2015. This race was the start of the healing process after it was announced that Jules Bianchi, who had a horrific crash in Japan 2014, 
never woke up from his coma nine months later and had passed away that week. This race was the start of that healing process. And there was mistakes from Hamilton. And it was Vettel that came out on top. Equally. Won. Ayrton Senna. In terms of race wins. But if there was ever a race to start the healing process. Of the passing of a driver. This was it. Number five. The 2010 Korean Grand Prix. Championship race was still wide open at this point. Sebastian Vettel was leading during the early stages of the race from Mark Webber. There was a collision on lap 18 between Mark Webber and Nico Rosberg. Forcing Webber, who was a championship contender at this point, out of the race. And then amazingly, Sebastian Vettel... Looks like he was going to be out of the championship running after an engine failure on lap 51. On lap 45, sorry. And at this point, five drivers still in the running for the drivers' championship and three teams in the running for the constructors' championship. With two races to go, it was game on. Number four, Japan. 2000. I remember getting up at 6am to watch this race live at my dad's house. And amazingly, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have, the amazing thing was you never heard a, a word from me. I sat in front of the TV, had the volume turned down to make sure not to wake anybody else up. And I sat there and witnessed Michael Schumacher wrap up his first of five consecutive drivers' championships. It was a very special moment for, for me as a seven-year-old kid, seeing my favorite driver at the time not only win the race, but seeing the elation he had to wrap up his third Drivers' Championship and his first for Ferrari. Now we're into the top three now and these three races have a very special place in my heart for numerous reasons. And the rankings of these three might be controversial but for those who know me well as F1 fans will know exactly which three races I'm on about here. So number three in my top 10 races of all time, Canada 2011. To quote one Andre Harrison, this is what would happen if Michael Bay was asked to direct an F1 fil uh, race. There was... It was rain throughout the entire race until the climax. There was an over two hour rain delay and I remember watching it all play out on, on BBC One. And the co coverage ended up having to be switched over to BBC Two. It was a tough watch at over four hours. But we got there, we persevered we pulled through and we witnessed an absolute classic. Jensen Button had to come into the pits numerous times. He was a lap down and he was at the back of the field. But he clawed back that deficit. And what was the end result? The last lap. Chasing Vettel down. Vettel went wide. And Button taking the race win. Absolutely incredible. 
last to first and a lap down. What more can you ask for? Number two, Japan 2005. Now, one of the main reasons why I rank this race above Canada, one, because it's a much easier watch, but also two, it was a pure masterclass of driving skill from everyone that was involved that day. A wet weather qualifying saw Toyota and Honda on the front row, but the biggest moment was yet to come. There were so many incredible moments from that race that day. Montoya's crash on the first lap bringing out the safety car. Alonso overtaking Michael Schumacher on the outside of 130R at 180 miles an hour around one of the fastest corners on the calendar. 12 years old and seeing that sort of bravery with those beautiful V10s. Mwah! Yes! While I didn't get to see the race live, I did watch the race later as we had managed to tape it. And what an incredible race it was. The Drivers' Championship had already been won by Alonso at this point. But when all was said and done, It was absolutely glorious. But that wouldn't be the last of the bravery we saw from Alonso. He overtook Weber while, onto, while going onto the grass. And that secured him third place. And just when we thought the race couldn't get any more exciting, Fisichella trying to keep Raikkonen behind. Round the outside of turn one, on the last lap of the race, Kimi Raikkonen, who started from 17th on the grid, overtook Fisichella on the outside to take the race win. And... I'm not going to lie, I did recreate this moment on TikTok, folks. And this would have probably been how James Allen would have been in the commentary box. And I st I've lost count of how many times I've watched that race back. So, for one last time, honourable mention, 1976 Italian Grand Prix. The recap of the top 10 so far before we get to my number one Formula One moment of all time. Number 10, Austria 2020. Number 9, Germany 2019. Number 8, Brazil 2003. Number 7, Bahrain 2014. Number 6, Hungary 2015. Number 5, Korea 2010. Number 4, Japan 2000. Number 3, Canada 2011. And number 2, Japan 2005. So, what could possibly be the number one? 
number one in my top 10 races of all time, and therefore my number one Formula One moment of all time, Brazil 2008. For the second year running, Hamilton was in the running for the championship. But this time, he had to beat Felipe Massa. Fifth place again would guarantee Lewis won the title if Massa won. The race started with a heavy downpour, resulting in the team switching onto intermediate tyres. David Coulthard ended up out of the race on the first lap. Not the way he would have wanted to finish his F1 career. But the drama didn't start to heat up until towards the end of the race. Because it started to rain. The track was getting slippy. Everyone had switched on to the... Everyone had switched on to the intermediate tyres for the end of the race. Or so we thought. Kubica unlapping himself with a couple of laps to go. Lewis Hamilton goes wide out of Young Cow Corner. Vettel in his Toro Rosso gets through. Goes into fifth. And on count back, as it stood, Massa would still win because Massa had more wins than Hamilton that season. Hamilton couldn't keep up with Vettel. For about half a minute, we saw Massa cross the line and Ferrari had thought they'd wrapped up the championship. But just... Just a small question to ask them. Is that Glock? Is that Glock going slowly? Yes, it was. Vettel and Hamilton get past Glock. The Ferrari boys still celebrating at this point. They celebrated a little bit too early. And therefore, Hamilton's fifth place was all he needed to wrap up the championship. And at the time, became the youngest ever Formula One champion, before Vettel broke that record in 2010. When all was said and done, why did I have this as my top F1 moment of all time? It had a combination of everything. It was the last race of the season. Championship was up for grabs. The drama of it all. A case of anything could happen in that climax of the race. And the climax of the race. My heart rate, I swear on my life, watching it at my grandparents' house at the time, I can still, I can still remember that moment 13 years later. My heart rate was in trip, easily triple digits. I was sitting there, edge of my seat, like, what on earth is going to happen here? And there you go. Because if there's one thing we've learned in the world of sports, and especially in Formula One, is that anything can happen. And it's for those reasons, plus many more, that are why Brazil 2008 is my number one Formula One moment of all time. So there we go. That uh, now you guys know. Now you guys know about some of my favorite Formula One moments of all time and some of my favorite races. Are there any moments you would like me to talk about next time? 
feel free to let me know in the comments. And now that and now that we've gone through all that, 100 moments over 70 years of Formula One, and we're about to start the 72nd season of Formula One. And who knows what this season's going to have in store? And so, until next time, this is Fraser McKenzie otherwise known as Kenzie Retro, signing off. Thank you.